Welcome back to Hot Flashes and Cool Topics Podcast. We are so excited to be talking to Tamsin Fidel today. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, we run in these circles where we see each other kind of in, when there's events or yeah. you have been so busy. And before we talk about this incredible documentary coming out in October and your book, it's always interesting how women get started in this community because we all kind of have a similar story where we're doing one thing yeah. and then menopause hits. So can you share a little bit with our listeners about how you came, you went from being an Emmy award winning newscaster to a menopause advocate? Yeah. I, uh, yeah, it was, it wasn't anything in the plan, you know, <laughs> we're always like, okay, I've got a plan and this is what I'm doing next. Um, you know, it was, uh, November of 2019, uh, that I had had an incident in the news studio where I was, um, in between commercial breaks we have like a two and a half to three minute commercial break between, you know, news segments. I did the evening news for a very long time, almost 15 years uh, in New York at night. And, um, I was, you know, looking ahead to the next scripts and I got this flush from like the, I mean, if you had a hot flash, a really bad one, not a like, okay, that went away, but one where you just feel like you can't get control and your heart is racing and your body is sweating. And, um, you don't know if you're going to throw up or pass out or, you know, you just don't know what's happening. And this was in particular, uh, uncomfortable because I could feel my heart race and I could hear it in my ears. And I went, Some, something is not going right. So I said out loud, if I fall over, somebody catch me. And the um, sports anchor who stands up at a monitor across the studio looked and he goes, wait, are you joking? And I said, I don't think I am. Like, I, I didn't want to be, I, I didn't want to be alarmist. I was in a studio of all guys, but I didn't know what was really going on. And I thought, I also don't want to pass out on the air. So he uh, helped me off the set. I went to the bathroom. I just like laid on the floor next to the toilet. Not anything I would have done in the right mind. Um, got up not long after that, went to, uh, went home next week started making doctor's appointments. Like what's going on? Is there something, is it more serious? Is it something bad? And if I had thought back, which I did eventually think back and go, okay, you've gained some weight, your sleep is crap, but maybe that's because of stress. You're uh, on Lexapro because you went to the doctor talking about, you know, anxiety and depression and moodiness. Um, I'd had a lot of moments at work where I'd be looking at a word and then not be able to read the word off the teleprompter. But I thought, you're tired. You know, I always gave everything an excuse, you know? And, um, so finally I got a, a note, my patient portal after those initial, um, appointments that it said in menopause, any questions? And it was like the doctor's signature under it. That was it. And I went, what? I'm too young for menopause. That there must be something wrong. And I remember my now husband, then I think boyfriend, I think he was my boyfriend at the time we were engaged. I was like, I'm in menopause. I can't have children. He was like, but you weren't going to, you made that decision <laughs> a long time ago. I'm like, but now it's official. So I, um, that's where it kind of started for me. Um, but I think what really started outside of that physical incident was, um, going back and doing research, like as a journalist, I'd always like wanted, you know, what are the answers? How did I not, you know, what, do I, what else do I need to know? And when I hit upon that number of 1 billion women are going to be in menopause by 2025, remember this is you know, not now we're in 2020. I went, what? That, that, that can't be right. And then I started understanding what it was. And then I heard the word perimenopause. And then I heard, you know, I, I, all these things that came together, like this wall of, oh, that's why I had my period for a month. And then I didn't have it for four months. And that's why I, you know, so I just didn't know what I didn't know and, um, started looking into the information and the research and then met up with Jo um, Joanne Lamarca, who is one of my document, one of my four documentary partners. And we were like, we need to do something. We tell every other story in the world and we're not talking about this. So we really started grassroots on our iPhones going, we're going to do a documentary about this. People need to know, like we had no idea that all this was, you know, that there was a community, any of this. Um, and that's really where it began. And, uh, I feel like I thought my, my story was unique and I came to find out as knowing and meeting more people, it's anything but. Right. Did you find when you were, when you sent that thing, your doctor sent you the information back and you're in menopause signature okay. at the end. What do you do? I know. What do you, what did you find? What was surprising? I know it was surprising to me when I found out how much doctors really know about menopause what did you find was so surprising i guess i 
what I found most surprising was like, okay, so here's what you do. You know, take two pills and call me in the morning. You know, there was no follow-up from that. It was like, yeah, it happens. That was what I read into it. And I was also, I feel like because it's this new season and this transition and this next place in life, it just needed a little bit more care. You know, it just needed a little bit more than like, uh, you know, your vitamin D levels are low. It just felt very, uh, and to a woman, and this is a male doctor. And I know not all male doctors like that because there are uh, many that are amazing. But, but in this case in particular, I was like, what do you mean? But I was just so upset that it wasn't like, this is a moment that I need to, I need some love. And so I, I think that, um, I felt pretty alone and I, and I, none of my friends had talked about it, whether one, I found out I had gone through it and she goes, I breezed through it. And you know, now she's like, is it too late for hormones? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, yeah. and then there's others, but they never talked about that to me. And, uh, my mom had breast cancer and died of breast cancer at a, at a young age. She was diagnosed at 44, died at 51. And I, you know, now have learned that, you know, she went through a, a medically induced menopause and no idea. So I, I did feel it was just kind of very eh, dismissive. Right. Because you have a voice in the community that can spread, spread a lot of information at any point, did you feel like, Oh, if I start going down this road, I don't know what's going to happen with my career. A hundred percent. I'm so glad you asked me that actually, because I, I don't think that we always give that as much spotlight as it needs to be because it's we're all talking about it and we feel good talking about it because we're talking about it with each other but the truth is is that if you walk into most workplaces sometimes they make you feel like you're lucky to be there sometimes you work really hard to get where you've gotten sometimes you're trying to hold on because you're worried about age you're worried about your sex you're worried about your your experience whatever it is and um to add this on top of it you know, made me worry that I was going to go out there and say something and then risk being found out that I was 49 or 50, that I was, you know, uh, in menopause and in, in that the, the, it symbolizes so many things that we wanted to not symbolize anymore. And we want to rewrite this narrative, but I know it's going to take a long time and it's going to take voices making more and more noise, but I did worry about it. And, um, and it was why I actually started talking about it on social media over on TikTok. It was TikTok was my dirty little secret. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to go there because I don't know a lot of people from work, but I know there's a lot of people there. And that was where I started kind of reading those symptoms. I had read something that said there's 34 symptoms or whatever symptoms. And I literally read them off of a teleprompter app on my phone. There's an app that like, is like a teleprompter. You can just read them. That's all I did. And, um, and I just remember thinking like, I want people to see it, but I don't know if I want everybody to see it that I know. Once I did that, and once I realized that there was this, you know, um, this kind of swell happening. And then I, I posted on Instagram, Instagram's where I got very nervous because it was people that I knew. And some people, you know, one woman in particular said like, what are you doing? That is not sexy. Like that is not gonna, that's not gonna bode well for you in a career that that worships youth. But I felt like the conversation was important enough that I kept pressing forward and wow, am I glad I did. But yeah, it didn't come without its its bit of fear for sure. Yeah, you know, so I I saw you on social media a lot and I follow you on both TikTok and on Instagram. My dirty and, little secret. <laughs> your dirty little secret, but so so glad that it's out there, that someone with a platform has it out there. What did you find are some of the most common things that women would talk about on the social, on social media? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the two big things are, you know, I felt like I was going crazy and I felt like I was alone. And now I think the the next big question is where do I find a menopause practitioner that knows what they're talking about or a provider that I can trust? And I think that's a great leap of questions, right? To, because I think that that means that people are getting informed and not only are they getting informed, but now they're doing the next thing is advocating for themselves. Because I think that that's, I think it's awful to put the onus on us to have to advocate for ourselves, but there is no choice. And so it is why I keep pushing for it, why all of us keep pushing for that. And it's so necessary, but I hope that a day comes. And part of my reasoning behind the, the documentary is that we can educate people, uh, faster, 
on a bigger, you know, bigger groups on a, a quicker basis, because we not only have to educate women, we have to educate the doctors, we have to educate the schools, we have to educate the, the hospitals, we have to educate men. And so we have a, in politicians and, and the people that control the purse strings. So I think that we have a lot of work to do, but um, I want women to feel like they have control and they're not waiting for everybody else to tell them what to do. So let's talk about the purse strings a little bit. The M factor, it's coming out October 17th. We are so excited. We saw a little preview on social media and some of just pe- women we have had experts we've had on the show and and so many more and we cannot wait to see it but did you approach companies be like hey we're doing a menopause documentary would you like to fund it what was the response a lot of companies um we did a lot of the self, the self funding um and we haven't talked too much about it but yeah we did that because it was that important to us but uh you know we had we had different response we had response like uh yeah i don't know if that's big enough i don't know if that's a big enough topic i don't know if that's a topic for us um you know i don't you know that's not where we're putting our money right now um and, and so i i think i felt I, I will say that was discouraging in some ways um but when we got the green light that we had a place for it to air and a place for it to be seen. then we said like, it doesn't matter what we're doing. We're all throwing everything we have into this in terms of, you know, sweat and lots of sweat and, um, and finances and making sure it happens. And so we really, um, were so lucky that, we had experts that came forward that that gave their time. We had women that came forward and shared their story. We had, um, you know, the, I work with four women and um, it's just been this, I'm, I was sad. I was excited when I got the final version two days ago. And then I was sad because I'm like, oh no, it's been, it's such an, and now, you know, now we're going into the, the screenings and stuff. So I know it's not, it's not over, but we've been like, it's been this little baby, you know, that we've been really working on and making sure that every frame is perfect and making sure that it's not about um, jokes and it's about education. And that was, that was really important to us. And it, it did change from where we were at the beginning. You know, at the beginning we were like, well, we'll do some movie clips and we'll do some this and we'll do some that. And then we went, you know what we're going to do? We're going to spend the time that we have for this film and we are going to educate and we are going to talk about the things that women need to see in one location and be able to talk about. So then when they see it, they can go have those conversation amongst themselves. So that was really important to us. And uh, it was exciting to see that change. Did you find, what did you find the most surprising about the whole thing? Did you learn? I mean, I know you learned, but (laughs) what did you find that was so surprising when doing this? Yeah, I, um, that's a good question. I think that, I think what I found, um, the misinformation that we all know about with the 2002 study, you know, I, I knew that, and I knew that kind of the top line of that, but I don't think I really understood how deep it went in terms of, you know, we have doctors in there that were practicing during that time and got those phone calls to their offices with women screaming at them. We got, we have experts that were just finishing medical school during that time or just entering medical school. So it's been interesting to see the different, the different ways it affected it, but it affected everybody. And then I think that was a surprising part to me because I realized how many layers deep it went. Um, and I, as somebody who's been in the media for such a long time, feel like the media did such a disservice to not make sure that those same headlines were corrected. Um, so that's one thing. And I, I guess the other part, um, was, you know, was really understanding sex and understanding what, you know, the, the things that can be done to help and that we don't just have to shrug and say like, well, it's just kind of how we are and that we're really working toward that next area of understanding and testosterone and, um, you know, and the women who spend day and night trying to make a difference and make those changes and educate. And I thought it was really good. And we just, like I said, saw a quick preview, but that you had not only experts, but you had women going through it because it seems in our community, the strongest conversations are between women are just sitting at a table, having a cup of coffee, but those can really change the trajectory. What are your hopes for this film? It's on PBS, which is great. So anyone can go see it, but what are your hopes for this film? What do you hope for it to accomplish? You know, I hope the film um, makes women feel like 
they're, they're not alone in that they have control and there's there's somebody out there that can help them. And now we've got to get them to that person. I hope it it matches them with a, you know, a doctor that they feel like they can find a doctor. I feel like that we shatter the silence. I feel like it becomes a movement. I mean, I know that we're we're seeing that in so many ways, but we didn't want it to just be a film one and done. We really want it to create a movement so that when women are coming to see it, that's why we're when we license it out, we say licensing, but we're giving it to you know, different groups that want to host a screening. So they'll be able to say, okay, I've got 25 people that want to see this, or we're going to put together, you know, uh, one of the doctors, Dr. Kelly Casperson has put together an auditorium of women um, to, to bring this together. So that gives me chills. Um, but it just, it, it lets me know that that's how we move that needle so that if somebody isn't on social media or isn't watching TV, but may watch it on online or may be willing to go to a, a theater with their friends and see it that we're moving this message forward because we're reach, we, we're reach, we reach people in all different ways. You know, we reach people by podcast, we reach them by social, we reach them all over the place. And I want to make sure that, you know, we're doing our part uh, with this. So that's why we have it in so many different areas. And it's not just, um, you know, hope you catch it once. So it'll be, you know, you'll check your listing for depending on the city you live in, it'll be on pbs.org. And then we'll also be able to license it out for the screening. So those we've gotten an, a tremendous response from women all over the all over the world, actually. And uh, yeah, so it's exciting to see, but it also tells me the, the hunger for it, you know, the hunger for that information. Right. You know, that's what I was going to ask you. Do you have some confirmed areas uh, where it's going to be shown? Um, confirmed areas where it's going to be shown on air or, or I mean, a screening. Like, I mean, oh, a screening. Nashville. Yeah. For sure. yeah. yeah. Like oh, Nashville. Nashville <laughs> yes. <Yeah. Is> <laughs> Nashville? Um, we're doing a couple in New York. Um, LA is being scheduled right now. Um, Kelly's is in, in Washington. Um, but we're going to put a list on the website for any of them that are, are public screenings. And then we're asking people to do the same, like within their, their immediate group. And, um, but we're going to try to hit ourselves. I think we're doing a, a 10, 10 or 15 city tour ourselves. And then we have, um, like over a hundred screenings that people are reaching out for asking to do their own screenings. So yeah. That's so amazing. It's That's yeah. Really so it's exciting. It's, uh, yeah. So if you're interested, if someone's interested, in, I mean, you all know, but if you're interested in doing a screening, um, you know, let us know, we'll send you the information. It's a really like a, a quick form to fill out, but it's just basically, we don't want it to pop up on YouTube or somewhere, you know, so right. we just have to, you know, have that in place, but otherwise we'll, we will send that, um, so people can watch it and, you know, and share it and, and have that conversation afterwards. There's like a, a kid in there that uh, allows you to have conversation starters and ask questions of each other. So you'll get all of that. It's like a toolkit. Um, but we just want to be able to help further the conversation for people within their own, you know, wherever they're going to have it, a theater or a community center, libraries are having them. So yeah, we're, oh, we're excited. Really that's, excited. That's so exciting. And when you're with a group of similar people that have this, just the same interest that they are yeah. involved, then I don't know, it just the shared experience with other yeah. people really makes it exciting. Beyond. So, and, I, and I think that that's what, you know, we go back to the storytelling aspect of it that you all know really moves that needle. And, and I think that that's where we have people um, bring things up that they feel they don't have anyone to talk to about it, or they feel like it's just them, or they feel awkward about it. And um, you know, that's, I mean, that's what I try to do on social media is make it um, a safe space for people to be able to talk about those kind of things, because I don't know that we have very many of those. Right. And we have to create them. Right. Were you completely shocked when you started getting hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram, on TikTok? Yeah. I'm still shocked. But <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I didn't, you know, I've been doing journalism for a really long time and um, told a lot of people stories and a lot of different type of stories. And I, I always like, you know, read somebody else's script, right. Or told somebody else's story. So uh, doing this was very uh, foreign to me and very raw and not quite so comfortable uh, initially. And um, so to see that response, at first it was a little scary. I'm like, so every single <laughs> word, I'd look at every word that I was typing. I'm like, is that, is that grammatically correct? You know, I want to make sure that I didn't get credit. And now I'm like, ah, oh, it's fine. Somebody will tell me if it's wrong. 
Um, but yeah, it, but it also speaks to the need, right? And I and I do think it speaks to the conversations that we really want to be having and um, that there maybe hasn't been an outlet for. And now finally, we're seeing podcasts like yours and we're seeing, you know, social media accounts and doctors and experts and advocates speaking out. And um, I love how this is connected us all around the world. Like I, I, that blows my mind. Like I have friends in the UK now. What, when did I get that? <laughs> you know, but it's, it's just really amazing because everybody is got the same purpose and everyone's got their head down doing the same purpose. And I just don't think I've ever met a community quite like this. So it's pretty special to me. Yeah, it really is. And if, if you aren't following her, on on Instagram or TikTok. They're really great. They really are. I think what you do, you share things that are just practical or even that people are too embarrassed themselves to bring up and you just share them. And so, and I say this so much, Colleen's probably sick of hearing me saying, but it makes people feel not alone. It makes oh, them feel you. like I'm not the only one how do I put this patch on? How do I, yeah. you know, how do I get the glue off? <laughs> how do I, yeah. How do I get ready? What are, you know, if I am in my midlife and I am facing a life a change in life, whether it's a relationship change or a change in your family, I think when you address these, it does somebody that has your platform, it just really helps them. It really helps them feel like I'm not the only one going through this. There are lots of other people going through this. So if you're not following, Tamson on on social media. You need to do that. Mm -hmm. And then I, I wanted to ask, I know your book, is it being released in March of 2025? It is. Could you share yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, it's called How to Menopause. <laughs> Cause I feel like it's the one thing we haven't learned how to do, you know? And so, um, yeah, I started that about two and a half years ago. And I think what was important to me with the book was while I was interviewing all these doctors to also make sure that there were a lot of other things that we realize that menopause affects, you know, and it affects us often, most of the time at a time where we're going through a lot of stress, we're dealing with relationships, empty nest, trying to, our bodies are changing, you know, how we work out is changing what I have to eat differently than I did when I was 30. I can't, you know, have a margarita and a pizza at 12 o'clock at night and be okay the next morning to go work out at 6 a.m. No. And so I, I just felt like it was important to address those things because I'm not a doctor. Um, but what I did do is I um, interviewed 42 experts in the book and um, we talk about all these different topics. And so I wanted to make sure that it had more of that lifestyle approach to it because we have some incredible doctors with great books. A lot of them are in this book with their expertise. And so I wanted to make sure that, you know, it goes beyond the doctor's office to the bedroom and the boardroom and beyond and in real life. And so that's, that was my focus for it. And, um, so I'm excited. It was, it was another thing that I was like, oh gosh, we're doing the revealing of the cover. Like all these things make you very nervous and then it's done. You're like, okay, I don't know what I was nervous about. It's good. <laughs> so um, it's over, but, uh, yeah, I'm excited about it. You also took a leap of faith in leaving your job to start all this. Yeah. What was that final? I, this is my next path. This is what I know I have to pivot to. You know, it's funny. Um, I'm coming up on a year and, um, on no November the 11th and I, I can't believe it. Cause every month I like the day I left every month, I'd be like, uh, it's been a month. Um, am I doing okay? Everything's okay. It's been a month, but, but you know, it's just, it's very scary. I did that career since 2000 and, um, two, no, I'm sorry, 1994. So, um, I've had a career in journalism for a really long time, but I, I think that I couldn't stop having this conversation. One, I think that I, I could see that I wanted to do more and I couldn't, you know, I was splitting my time. I was doing, uh, four, four newscasts a day and trying to do this in the morning and split between these two things and trying to speak. And so it was getting hard. And then I realized like, this was a story I kept bringing up. So when, uh, you know, they'd say like, what do you want to talk about say at four o'clock? And I'm like, you know, there was a new study on brain health and perimenopause. They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I realized like that was telling me everything. Like that's what was really driving me at that point and getting that information. And I thought that if I can do that and figure out a way to, to go forward in the next, you know, few years and have that be the, the focus, that's what I really wanted to do. And so now we're almost a year out. And um, so for the documentary and the book to be released is um, kind of surreal right now for me, but uh, super exciting. How yeah. people can find out about the documentary and about yeah. the book and your yeah, website. Absolutely. 
Um, yeah, all of it's on the website because I just wanted to put it in one place. If you want to go to Instagram at Tamson Fidel, and then um, the book is howtomenopause.com. And um, I am, I did, we did put up a in, Instagram account um, called the M Factor. And so we're, if you are interested in hosting or want more information about it, you can email me directly and, and I will make sure the team gets back to you. It's info at Tamson Fidel uh, because we want to just make sure that people that are really curious and, and interested in hosting get that information right away so they can sign up for it and be able to do it, you know, in their communities. Because I know hosting takes, you know, you've got to, put it all together and everything. So I know it takes time. Thank you so much, Tamsin. And the Thank next you. one needs to be on post-menopause because we are finding that the conversation is now starting to gear towards what happens after all this. So yes. I think the next documentary should be post Well, I factor. agree with you on that. I agree with you on that because I think that um, that's what I was talking about with the book. It just needed to go to the next place because I felt like I had all this information and now I'm here and I didn't want it to be like, and it's really hard. And so the, you know, the book is like about reinvention and relationships. And so I want, I, I agree with you on that. So maybe we need that conversation. Absolutely. We'll, we'll talk offline. There's well, a lot. Exactly. Online. There's a lot. Yeah. There's, mm -hmm. And we'll have to have you back on, please, when the book oh, comes out. I would out. love it. I look forward to seeing you in Nashville. Yes, I know. It'll be yes. great. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me.